One, two, three, four. everybody to scuba confidential it's marcus here with the rest of the gang hey, we're back excellent um so it's me and with me are my two good friends mr ian hello and louise hello so we're on episode number 13 13 yeah. i'm lucky for some hopefully not for us um with a few things to talk about first of all before we get too far into the podcast itself i just wanted to say that the last month so february we had about a thousand downloads, Brilliant. which is a, a new record for us. It's absolutely incredible that a thousand people wanted to listen to our jibber jabber. It's awesome, isn't it? That is that is fantastic. So thank you to anyone who downloaded and listened to us and has been supporting us throughout all that. It has been just amazing that, that people would want to hear what we have to say. <laughs> um, that's been, it's, it has been really really good. We also wanted to say for for some of the people listening to us, don't be scared to review us, to rate us, to give us some positive feedback on on your various yeah. channels where you listen to it, whether it happens to be iTunes or Stitcher or Acast or whatever your place where you pick the podcast up from. Please, you know, do give us a positive view. It all helps to to promote us and to allow us to make more as a consequence of that. So get stuck in. If you like us, give us a nice five star rating and a positive review and that'll help us. I think it helps us um, sort of move up the charts and things like that and spreads the word, doesn't it? If they review. Spread the good word of Scuba Confidential. That's what it's all about. Um, On this week's episode, what we're going to talk about is what we've been up to. We've just come back from the dive show. Some of you guys might have even seen us wandering around. We've got Lou with the news and she's talking about whales in captivity and the Great Barrier Reef. And then we're going to go into a topic we were considering off the back of the previous episode to do with preparation for the season in terms of diving fitness, how we can prepare ourselves. We've talked a little bit about scuba equipment. We want to talk about how we can prepare ourselves for the season. So we're going to get into that very, very shortly. First of all, I guess we can talk about what we've been up to. We went to the dive show. It was at the mm-hmm. the Rico Arena in Coventry on the 24th of February. I really enjoyed it. What did you guys think? It was uh, really good. Uh, I thought there's really good atmosphere there, um, really good stands. Um, I think most of the big players, most sort of big brands were there. And um, it was good to sort of catch up with people. Um, really good speakers and um, it was sort of nice to walk around with there's a nice buzzy atmosphere different speakers going on and you didn't feel too crowded you know it was nice to walk around in your leisure and stop and see what different people were, were talking about and stuff like that it was good there's lots of exciting new products to to view as well and you know certainly you know dive destinations there's some really inspiring places to look at and it's nice to catch up with some people, you know, that I bumped into previously. Yeah, I thought it was I thought it was a real nice atmosphere. There's a few people I was just going to mention that we either spoke to or saw in action. First of all, <laughs> thank you to Sunto for giving us those VIP passes and letting oh, us yes. into their bar area. Always. <laughs> yeah, <that's nice. laughs> we, we we appreciated a vodka and cranberry juice. That was very that was very nice. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So thank you. Didn't to, need much persuasion. Yeah, thank you to Sunto for that. And also, there were a couple of the presentations that we saw that were fantastic that I I just wanted to mention. The first one was I think Lou and I saw. I don't know if Ian saw. Was Jill Hyneth. And Jill Hyneth, for those who don't know her, is a Canadian cave diver, underwater explorer, TV presenter, and she also works as a consultant for the movie industry. So in films, she'll be brought in as a consultant when they're talking about diving. And she did an amazing talk on on cave diving. And cave diving is something that has always been, well, I've always thought of it as a bit of a black art where people are really into it and you have this perception of it being dark and dangerous and and perhaps extremely challenging and inaccessible. And, and the images she brought and the presentation she did just changed my perception a little bit of cave diving. Mm. I thought it was amazing. Yeah. I mean, you saw some of that, Lou. What did you think? Yeah, I th- thought she's found 
she she kind of made it seem very accessible and relatable like you say you know cave diving is such a a far away entity from the diving certainly that we're used to doing just standard recreational diving but the way she explained it and she had a, a great slideshow as well with some mm. of her amazing photography and yeah it's really inspiring stuff actually and, and also you know hearing it come from a woman as well you know, yeah and without kind of flagging that up too much it was it was really nice to see a really inspiring woman who's accomplished so much in um in her career so far yeah yeah and um i'd I was just really um, taken back by the photos, the clarity of some of the photos. Mm. Yeah. Um, that couldn't have been easy because some of the photos I saw, she must have been clambering through some really tight spaces mm. uh, to get camera equipment through and your dive gear, you know. Um, that takes some doing. Mm. Uh, and uh, some really lovely photos of some mm. of the fish that, and different organisms that she uh, took pictures mm. of. And, um, really important yeah. research as well and studies that have been conducting has shown up so much about you know the natural world and the history of the natural world. Really interesting stuff. Yeah, I, I thought it was fascinating. I, I learned some some lots of things when I was listening to her talk. Um, what what I found amazing is I'd always thought it was going to be dark and it was going to be obviously cave diving by definition you're enclosed. But some of the photos there was the light going through the water and through mm. some of these caverns underwater mm. and it was very very beautiful as mm. well. The bit that stuck out for me that was the um, kind of archaeological aspect of it where. She had photos and, and images of the skulls of long extinct animals yeah. that they found mm, in yeah. some of these caverns. Mm. And one, the one the bit that, that I really remembered was one of these particular animal skulls had kind of a metal grill on, on yeah. the, the teeth that remained where the Mayan people had been u- using these animals to hide valuables as they were moving from one area of Mexico to another on their travels, mm. you know, historically. And it was something I'd not even considered before, so it's a real eye-opener listening to some of what she had to say. She also was talking about some of the, the diving that she'd done, particularly one out in Florida that stuck out in my mind, and, and to give you, for the recreational divers out there, a flavour of the, the complexity of the diving that she's doing. She was talking about a dive that involved a 22-hour runtime, a 22-hour mission, where she was 300 feet deep, um, in terms of doing doing the dives, I mean that's 100 meters yeah. to to us Europeans, which is just incredible. The, the kind of demands that your body must be under when you're making those sort of dives and the, the planning that goes into mm. it. So I thought that was mm. fascinating. It's not a five minute dive. Yeah, we're not we're not just doing a. <laughs> it's not a bimble on the shelf at Stony Cove, is it? No, no, no. <laughs> we're not just going on a reef dive for 40 minutes at 10 meters. No, um, so that was that was really good. We also, if some of you may have seen our Facebook page or Instagram feed, and if you haven't, why not? Um, we also bumped into Miranda Kristovnikov, who is a TV presenter, radio presenter. She's appeared on The One Show from time to time. She's also the president of the RSPB, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, who is something close to your heart, I know, Louise. Mm-hmm. And not that we're bosom buddies with her by any stretch of the imagination, but she took some time after one of her presentations to come and have a chat with us about what we're doing really nice. with, with the podcast. And we really appreciated that. It was Her talk, again, was inspiring. She was talking about what it was like to be a TV presenter, mm-hmm. to, to be in this diving environment where you're, you're put under the North Sea and only you, you're doing the dive, but you're having to present and be articulate and be in a demanding environment and be coherent and, and present information in a nice way to people. It's so not easy. It was, it's not easy, and, and it was incredible to listen to her and to, to meet her firsthand. And just just to spend five or ten minutes was much appreciated. So on the off chance you're listening, Miranda, thanks very much for your time. <laughs> We're sorry for pestering you, but it, it was it was a it was a privilege to just to meet someone who's involved in that level and, and that level of awareness in the diving industry. And again, some of the photos that she shared were, were brilliant. It was interesting some of the photos that she shared on the boat that when they were pre- preparing for their dive, mm. and um, you know that was that was really good. So uh, I, I like that. Yeah, I thought it was good. Anything else you, you wanted to mention from the show, guys, before we move on from... Not really, no. I think it's it's really important that, you know, now diving is so much in, more in the mainstream that there are these shows that, that cater to to everybody, or, you know, regarding all aspects of diving, not just, you know, gnarly cave diving or deep diving, but all aspects. And I think it's really nice to, you know, go there and actually pick up stuff and meet people and interact yeah. yeah, and uh, one actually following on from that, what, one thing that occurred to me was, is that there's a good mix of uh, recreational diving aspects, the holiday 
uh, aspects, but also there was some a technical diving aspect to it mm-hmm. as well. Mm. That, you know, there was some of the the brands from the technical uh, diving world. They were there, so it was good to see a good good mix. Mm. Yeah, and um, for me, I was able to, and you guys as well, talk to a few people on some of the stands and. Hopefully, a couple of those will come to fruition where they may be guests on the podcast going forward. We're going to have some ongoing conversations with some of those people. Ian? And it's actually good to see there was this, uh, an area an area there where that you could actually jump in and you could try kit out. They had two big uh, pools there where you could just go in. There was in. a rebreather. Pool, there was a rebreather um, set up where you could go and try and have a dive on that. And it was good that you could go to a show and actually get wet. Yeah. So it's good. I think it was one of those events where you didn't necessarily need to be a diver to, to, to get something out of it. I thought it was really, really good. Yeah, cool. Anything else on the show, guys, or anything else you guys have been up to before we move on? I'm um, just getting ready for the, the start of the season. Yeah, cool. Yeah, the shop's been picking up, so the shop's been really busy over the past few days. We've been lucky enough to have some lovely weather here in the UK, haven't we? Yeah. So I think that's kind of got everyone in the mindset of, oh, I want to get outdoors, I want to go diving, which has been really been nice like to summer. see. It has, yeah. Yeah. It's one of our fake springs before it goes back to snow for a few (laughs) weeks. And then the real spring arrives a few weeks from now. Okay, well, if we've finished what we've been up to, um, we'll move on. I think it's time for Louise with the news. So, first up on the news is that the news that Russia has recently ordered the release of nearly 100 whales, um, which are being kept in cages in the port town of Nakhodka. And according to the Kremlin, 87 beluga whales and 11 orcas, or killer whales, are being held in a bay near the Sea of Japan. And um, this particular bay, where the cages are, has been dubbed a whale prison. Um, And essentially the whales are being kept there captive uh, whilst they await exportation to Chinese buyers predominantly. Mm. And um, the matter has drawn widespread international concern and criticism from politicians celebrities and the general public and the actual the actually the actor Leonardo DiCaprio has shared an online petition and that's so far gathered more than 900,000 signatures it's incredible so it's really bringing it into the the public domain president vladimir putin has stepped up and reportedly called for the creatures to be released into their natural habitat um although it's unclear as to when that will actually happen when they actually be released, um, cold weather and icy conditions pose big threats to the whale safety and welfare at the moment. So you can imagine mm. it's pretty cold in, in that part of the world at the yeah. moment. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's something to certainly keep an eye on. And it's great that it's been flagged up and that yeah, there's, a, there's a public outcry about it. Yeah. I mean, whether... I have to be careful here when we're talking about Putin because I may be <laughs> visiting Salisbury Cathedral or something in the future. But... Um, <laughs> Whether it will actually happen, you know, that's open to debate when these things mm. are. Sometimes he has been known to, to use propaganda for, for mm. good publicity. Yeah, some people are being quite cynical about yeah. it. Yeah, but you can only hope with these kind of things that it will come to fruition. I think, for, I mean, this is just me personally, I can't speak for anyone else, but I think keeping whales in captivity, um, whether it's orca or beluga whales, is, is not a pleasant thing. And if anyone out there wants to know the kind of stresses that these animals are put under, I'd recommend watching the film Blackfish, which came out in 2013. It's an American documentary Mm. that follows the the lives of some of these orca that are kept in captivity and the extreme stress that they're under. Some of them, the whales clearly seem to be kind of psychologically damaged Mm. by, understandably, by the experience and some of their attacks on their trainers and this kind of thing. You can understand that, can't you? Mm. Absolutely, yeah. So you'd hope that um, this will be the first of many steps and and the the, the sort of weaning off popularity of of these uh, aquariums. Mm. I think it's it's good. I'm going to take this on face value. Um, So it's good that it has gone to the top and uh, President Putin has got involved and he's saying, you know, these do need be released and, mm. and I hope they, they are because you know they shouldn't be they shouldn't be uh, put up for auction to the highest bidder for anyone to buy they should just mm. be returned to the natural world and that's it you know and that should happen you know as soon as you know and um, they should to me they no they shouldn't be put up for the highest bidder mm. and um, the sooner they do release them the better really yeah I agree with you I think you're spot on Russia's Federal Security Service, the FSB, has actually brought charges against four companies uh, related to fishing laws. So 
things are being done about it. It's just a case of when, and I think the world's going to be watching as to when these creatures are actually released into the wild and yeah. how they'll get on as a consequence. Yeah, fantastic. Well, let's take it like Ian said, at face value and hope something that is something positive and, mm. and they, they survive and, and go on to have fruitful lives. And I thought that was really great how Louise... Um, Pronounce the word uh, of the town. Actually, I was, I was sort of waiting for that. I don't really <laughs> Where know. <are> you? <laughs> I was born and bred there, Ian. Actually, no. Where, you're <laughs> have you not seen a Russian dancing after she went to the <laughs> yeah. had no. some vodkas at the Sunto yeah, stand? Yeah, Cossack. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, I see. Yeah, <laughs> not really. No. I think I think we're going to leave that there. Let's leave that there. What's next on the agenda, Lou? Well, Australia's Great Barrier Reef, as we know, has um, faced a few challenges over recent years. So not only from man-made pollution, but this time round, um, it's high rainfall, basically, affecting the Great oh. Barrier Reef. So essentially, high rainfall has raised river levels um, in the surrounding areas, and it's caused a flood of muddy and polluted water to push along the coastline uh, northeast of Queensland, from the Whitsunday Islands to Cape Tribulation. Right. Um, so it's a huge pl- plume of polluted runoff. And um, it's basically ending up in the Great Barrier Reef. Mm. Um, the largest river responsible for the sludge runoff is the, the Bird, Burdekin, which is reported to have a catchment area the size of England. So we're talking wow. a, a massive, massive yeah. area here. And you think all that sludge is running straight into that reef system. That's that's not good news at all. No. Um, I um, The Great Barrier Reef is one of those uh, iconic diving destinations and it's of course extremely famous with non-divers as well and I know that from speaking to to other people who've dived there recently and and some of the press reports coming out that the Great Barrier Reef's under stress anyway and this is just another Mm. problem for it really which it it doesn't really need so let's hope there's there's some steps taken to kind of uh, rectify this in some way and resolve the problem. Another nail in the coffin, really. You know, it's it's only a few days ago that the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority gave the go ahead for essentially a load of, well, a million tons apparently of sludge to be dumped in the Great Barrier Reef, which mm. is just that doesn't help ludicrous. Um, you know, this along with this natural runoff that's occurring, it's just the it seems to be a challenge upon challenge and crisis after crisis being imposed in this area and yeah. you know when you talk about diving to people one of the first questions they say is oh have you been to great barrier reef yeah you know it's one of the most yeah. famous places in the world to scuba dive and you know like i say it's this massive area mm. and it's just being decimated yeah at the moment. it is and um isn't it the uh, great barrier reef you can see from space it's funny you say that ian because i think marcus has got a few facts for us here ah. i've come here armed with some great barrier reef <laughs> facts so Fact, the Great Barrier Reef is the world's largest reef system. Um, It's composed of over 2,900 individual reefs that together comprise the Great Barrier Reef. It also is comprised of 900 islands stretching for 2,600 kilometres. And you're absolutely right, it can be seen from space, Ian. See, I thought I was right. He was spot on. (laughs) Give that man a coconut. (laughs) Thank you. Or cake. Or a cake, Cake. yeah. Back to cake. Back to cake again. The size of it, just to give it some perspective on the Great Barrier Reef, is greater in size than the UK, Holland and Switzerland combined. Is it really? So that's wow. just the, the size of this as, an, as a natural wonder is just absolutely incredible. Finally, the final fact I'm going to give you just about this kind of species that, that you may find there if you're lucky, 30 species of whales, dolphins and porpoises have been recorded in the Great Barrier Reef and also six species of sea turtles come to the reef to breed. Yeah. So it is a vital and incredibly large um, natural wonder, and you just hope that we, as a species, can take better care of it going forward. Mm. Yeah, You often find David Attenborough there as well, don't you? Sorry, he? Sir David Attenborough. <laughs> he, he, he can't get enough of it, Ian. He's always popping up there. <laughs> I'm sure if we, he'll be somewhere along that 2,600 kilometres if he... <laughs> He's all over it. Like he, he's all over it. He snorkels up and down on a <laughs> non-stop does. basis. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. So yeah, hopefully, you know, somebody. I mean, it, obviously, yes. Yeah, this particular instance where the the dumping of the sludge, um, it's the industrial residue essentially. Um, it's been met with widespread condemnation. 
from green party groups to the general public and it's it's hoped that somebody somewhere will step up to the plate and actually take these essentially you know, these big corporations on and try and do something about but it. I think it's a case of people power with this one, hopefully. But you kind of have to wonder at the meeting that went on where at what options were discussed. Because this couldn't have been... What when, do you mean? Well, well, when they were getting rid of that sludge, so the people who suggested, you know, dumping this sludge um, in the Great Barrier Reef, they must have looked at other options. So what were the other options? That can't have been the only option. Well, I think we're in danger of getting on a soapbox here, but I think mm. whenever you've got corporations involved like this, then it's going to be the most economical option yeah. <laughs> because they're beholden to their shareholders and their shareholders want the most profit. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be whichever is the most economical way of doing it within the law. Mm. A big conglomerate isn't going to be so as concerned with moral obligations or the natural world mm. as we are because they exist only to, to do one thing, which is to make money for the shareholders. Mm -hmm. So I think the conversation would have gone like that at a very senior level and that would have been the, the driving factor. I, I, I would hazard a guess that to, to dispose of this sludge in any other way would have just cost more money. Mm. Yeah. Different points and opinions seem to be, have been put forward, but the North Queensland Bulk Ports Corporation, which looks after Hay Point, which is essentially where all this is originating from, um, said that dumping sludge will only have a minor environmental impact. And they actually released a statement online claiming that their report showed the risks to be predominantly low with some temporary short-term impacts. Mm. But an impact is an impact, well, it whether is, it's minor it? or not, you yeah. know, and minor on the something the size of of uh, the Great Barrier Reef mm. is still still quite big. Mm. And um, The fact that they're just using that beautiful area as a, essentially yeah. a, a rubbish tip is absolutely mm. shocking. Yeah. yeah, and if there's anyone out there who is based in Australia and, mm. and has any more... <laughs> yeah, good day. Good day. <laughs> Um, has any more information on it or any any comment on it, please do write in and we, we'll always give our contacts information at the end of the show where you can get in touch with us or via Twitter or Facebook or whatever, whatever floats your boat. Yeah, we do actually have a few listeners um, on the Facebook page uh, that tune in, so that's good. Hello. Well, in, in Australia? Yep. Yeah, fantastic. Good. Cool. So and that wraps up the news. That, that wraps up the news. Awesome. All right, so on the previous episode, if you are able to listen to it, you'll have met the charming debonair Mr Duncan Baldwin, who came in to talk with us all about scuba regulators and equipment care. And the general theme of the last one was preparing your equipment for the upcoming season. We're now in the situation where we've just had our false spring and we're, we're, we're getting ready for the season to kick off in earnest and we're, we're preparing equipment. In fact, my dry suit is now on its way up to, to Scapa Flow to be, to be fettled before the season <laughs> so I stay nice and warm and dry. Um, no one, no one likes to come out of a dive mildly moist in a dry suit. So, no. so that's that's my plan. We also, as we get towards the beginning of the season, want to talk about how you can prepare yourself. So, our one of our big things, and and one of our one of the things we like to promote is good diving fitness. Mm. So, we'd like to just talk a little bit about diving fitness and how you can prepare for the upcoming season and why it's important. Diving fitness is is a key aspect of being a responsible and successful scuba diver. Diving itself requires very little effort and so essentially very little fitness in its purest form. If you're just hovering, of course, you're not moving at all. However, there are times when it can require a lot of effort, perhaps swimming against a current or involved in a rescue. At these sort of times, fitness can be really, really important. And for any form of diving, a good level of fitness gives a number of advantages, both for diving and in general. Diving benefits include reductions in breathing rate and tiredness yeah. and fatigue and all these kind of perks that you get with being fit for diving. And also, just generally, it reduces the, the chance of heart attack, injury, decompression, sickness when, when you go diving. So it is, is really, really important. That's quite a good way of putting it, actually, is that keeping fit is a perk. You know, mm. It's a perk for keeping healthy and, um, and being able to do things and have fun. I think that the thing that should go hand in hand when you when you talk about some of these things, the, the diving helps to keep you fit and you need to keep fit to to to, to, to stay diving and mm. stay diving at a good level. Um, we kind of broke it down when we when we were looking at it into different aspects of fitness. So like we said, when it comes to scuba diving, divers are putting their body through intense pressure, even though it might might not seem like it at the time. So there's physical stresses. You think about if you go in diving off the coast where we are, you might be kitting up in a car park at Weybourne to then walk 
fully kitted over a over a stony beach for a couple of hundred meters or so at least yep. to then get carrying your kit carrying your kit mm. to then put your fins on to then enter the water th- maybe through some waves to then do a surface swim before you've even begun the dive mm-hmm. and then you have to repeat that and process that's a good at the end 100 of the dive. meter yeah and so there's there's quite a considerable distance so you need that that fitness for that as you go further in your diving as well you start to get to rescue diver level and beyond you start to have more of a focus on other people who are in the water with you most people when they start out and they're an open water diver certainly they, they their buddy is there and we try as instructors and dive masters to encourage them to have that interaction look out for them but when people are brand new divers usually it's well i can see the instructor's fin so everything's groovy and they just <laughs> they just track you around like little ducklings but as you get further into your diving having that awareness of other other divers and being able to help them and if they have a problem help to deal with it fitness is absolutely key with mm-hmm. that as well so it's vital for that and then of course at rescue diver level and dive master level it becomes even more key it's one of these things with fitness where the higher up the tree you go the more vital the fitness is and there's lots of ways you can maintain your fitness and i think ian's got a few top tips from the king of bungie on how right, and yep, the sort of things yep. you might be be looking at well fitness. i'm kind of um kind of buzzing still from the fitness course i was uh, class i just had and yeah. uh, been a brilliant uh, morning actually on that front uh hello to uh uh, people from Lower Stoff who are listening, <laughs> so because um, some of them do. The Lower so Stoff really bossy, yeah, yeah, really good uh, fitness class this morning. So for us in the UK, it's more off season, I suppose, uh, because of the the weather and um, how it's probably best to look at it is, you know, you've got to try and keep fit. And you've got the start of the season coming, and it's a good time to really look at your fitness and um, look at w- what sort of fitness you are currently doing, if, mm-hmm. if any at all. And you don't have to, if you maybe you, you can't go to a gym or something like that, but if, if you are lucky enough to be able to go to a gym, you can uh, work on some uh, cardio, work on some uh, weights. And why, if while you're not looking to dive, you know, you can really uh, do some more on your weight training, build up some strength, uh, especially on your legs. Legs is really important. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people uh, do skip legs. And, skip uh, leg day, it's yeah, not good, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> and um, it's really important to, you know, when you're especially going to do a lot of diving in the city, make sure you've got, you know, you have got strong legs and it's, wor- it's worth working on that. And... Um, and with the importance of weight training, because you, the whole point of weight training, you uh, you kind of tear and yeah, you, the muscles, mm-hmm. which then repairs itself, which mm-hmm. in the whole full cycle makes you stronger. You, you know, you can do that because you, you, you're you not endangering yourself because you're not going to be going diving. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and that, that's really good. And you can also pair that with uh, some cardio. So you're looking at how you can uh, fat burn. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of gadgets about these days where you can look at and monitor your heart rate. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to spend, what I would recommend, you know, if for those who are not particularly interested in uh, weight training, you could spend 35, 40 minutes on a fast walk mm-hmm. just out on the street. Uh, having a, an eye, uh, one eye on your heart rate to see where you are to, for fat burning. You need to be roughly about seventy to eighty percent of mm-hmm. your maximum heart rate, and that way you'll be uh, reducing the fat level. Mm-hmm. And fat reducing the fat level is really important for diving mm-hmm. because uh, if you got the, if you got a higher percentage of fat in you, um, this, this increases your chance of getting a, uh, a, a DCS. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really important to. Uh, to bring that down mm. yeah um also in once you've moved out of the closed season and we're now you know in pre- preparation for sort of maintaining your fitness level you're, you know you're looking at your weight you're maintaining your weight level mm. down. what you can do is also instead of having using heavy weights you can use more lighter weights use more reps so you're looking at maybe 15 reps over three sessions and things mm. like that uh, at a time so you're still working on your heart rate still working mm. at your cardio still working on your reducing your fat levels mm. and i would encourage you as well is if you are a smoker it's really important to maybe look at that and reduce your smoking and look at maybe alcohol levels and things like that we'll quit all, all together. yeah and quit them. you know it's all all those things do really help yeah and my third point so because the um 
in the open season, what you what you really don't want to be doing is uh, vigorous workouts just before you're going to be going diving mm. or afterwards. Mm. It's really important that you you know you looking after yourself like that, keeping yeah. well hydrated. Hydration is really important. Yeah. Um, me, I try and work on taking in four liters a day uh, to keep a good hydration level. Yeah. And um, that's really important. Uh, during the open season, um, work, work on your cardio. Look at how you can just bring that down, uh, your your fat levels and that, and just keep keeping everything ticking over. But if you know you're going to be going diving at the weekend, I wouldn't work out the day before, and I wouldn't work out the day after, right? You know, because you're going to let you got to let that gas mm-hmm. vent out of your system. Well. Yeah, I, th- I think um, I think that's all really valid. What you've said, what, what I'm just going to say before we before we go any further is, for anyone who's listening, we obviously we're not doctors. We're three scuba idiots. So yeah. if you've you've got you're going to undertake any fitness training, if you've got any medical conditions, anything that may be of a concern, then do do consult a professional. Yeah someone medically trained before you start to train for diving don't listen to us on that aspect <laughs> we're just trying to give some general fitness adv- advice on this particular episode i think um everything you said was really valuable there Ian. and the last point i was just going to say is about swimming yeah you know um i try and go swimming at least once a week mm-hmm. and um i think it's really important that yeah. you know you maintain your strength in swimming um, and especially if you're thinking about if you haven't dived for a while mm. and, and maybe you, you're thinking about getting back in the water, stuff like that, before you rebook your uh, reactivate, mm. check where you are on your swim. Yeah. You know, can you get, get in? The, the, the minimum you need to be able to do is 200 metres. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, that's really important, that, especially if you're going to go into the sea where there's, you know, the, the currents, waves, mm. Um, that you you're strong enough to be able to do that, yeah. and uh, that's a, just a simple measure. I try and do it as a as a minimum when I go to swimming that I can do 200 meters. Yeah, I and, think that's absolutely key. Um, if there's rewinding when we're going we're talking fitness and we talk very generally about improving your diet fitness and these aspects to it, and you've given some some sound advice about you know cardio and muscle tone and trying to keep on top of it. Just generally, you yeah. know, it's not something that happens overnight. You have to. Mm-hmm. I mean, anyone who looks at, well, not so much Louise, but me and you, Ian, knows we're, we're not built like racing snakes. No. <laughs> um, but we do we do work on our fitness. We do try and work to be in a good position to do what we need to do as, yeah. as dive professionals. What I'd say is rewinding back to the beginning of your dive training, if you think back to your open water course, and I'm not going to, I'm going to use Paddy as an example, but other agencies apply fairly similar standards if you are undertaking a paddy open water course one of the the requirements is and i'm going to quote directly here have students complete a 200 meter stroke yard continuous surface swim or a 300 meter stroke yard swim with mask fins and snorkel and also that they can comfortably maintain themselves in water too deep in which to stand by completing a 10 minute swim stroke float without using any swimming aids now that happens when you qualify so there has to be there's the bare minimum standard there after that until you get to dive master level as you rightly said Ian it's kind of self-policing in that mm. you, the, the diver themselves mm. has to take responsibility for their own fitness and I agree t- with what you said in that sometimes people perhaps will come for a refresher course or when I've worked on boats in different parts of the world and they'll turn up and say I'd like to go diving and without being um, being too pointed about it, they're, 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 they're no stranger to a fish supper. You know, they're, <laughs> they're, 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 they probably haven't been, visited the gym recently no. or been out, you know, have any sort of exercise regime. Yeah. Now, when they qualified, they must have had mm. basic fitness to have made those 200 metre swims and yeah. done those floats. But yeah. whether they still have is 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 a is another matter, and it's maintaining that fitness, I think, is key. Yeah. Ian? Well, uh, an example I've had recently is I did a reactivate, and a lady come uh, for her reactivate, and uh, she hasn't dived in 10 years. Yeah. And I would say, um, you know, she hasn't done any swimming or anything like that for quite mm. a while. Yeah. And uh, when... 
I was talking to her, she was looking at going to the Great Barrier Reef, actually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's why she wanted to go. And, and I was thinking, you know, to if you haven't swam much and you haven't dived in 10 years, to yeah. so then just come to a reactivate uh, and not work on the actual side of your fitness and things like that. To, it's actually quite risky to then go jump in the sea and say, right, you know, I'm now going to go and do some diving and mm-hmm. stuff. Because, you know, you do need to be fit. And it helps with your air consumption as well. Yeah, you know, because you you don't need to gulp the air down and stuff mm. like that. Yeah, so it's that is really important to to look at that side of things as well. A lot can happen to your body in ten years. You know, That's right. we're all getting all older, aren't we? You know, different things. Apart from Ian. Well, yes. I'll be nearly Peter thirty. Pan, Peter Pan of diving, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's um yeah, it's taking like you say, it's making a conscious effort to to take control of your fitness. And you've not got to be, a, like you say, a hyperactive gym bunny going six days a week pumping iron. No. Just, you know, getting out, movement, hydration. It's all, mm. you know, it's all good for the human body, I th- obviously. I think you have to ask yourself, I think, is um, if you're going to if you're gonna go back and dive, or any time, really, even now, you know, for anyone, if, you know, can you do the minimum mm. 200 metres? Can, you know, and ask yourself that. And, and, you know, it's for your own safety and also for your buddy's mm. sa- safety. Well, because think- if they get in, into trouble... Could you tow them back? Yeah. I think that's the, mm. the key aspect of it. There's a tendency sometimes for divers to be quite inward looking and go, well, I think I'll be all right. Mm. The thing is with diving, it is a team activity. You've got your buddy, there may be other people in your dive group. Let's say you're diving in Red Sea or Thailand or something like that. There's a good chance there'll be a dive guide and perhaps four, five, six other divers in your group. You're part of that as a whole. You go into the water as a whole, as a, as a team, and you should come back as a team at the end of the dive so you have a responsibility not just to yourself but the other people who are in the water with you if you're a hazard you're also a hazard to them mm. so there needs to be that kind of self-reflection before you you undertake mm. some diving i was um diving off uh, actually the norfolk coast uh, a couple of years ago and uh, my buddy had cramp and um, he asked to surface and um so we went up and um we were, I think a lot of the other people who were in the group, they all carried on, but me and my buddy, my buddy wanted to come up, so we come up. And um, I, when, I, when we surfaced, I said to him, you know, are you okay to swim back? Mm. And he said, no. He said, I really, my cr- the cramp really hurts. Right. And uh, he was absolutely shattered as well. Mm. And uh, he was probably sort of getting on uh, age-wise. Mm. So I had to tow him back and uh, had the current against me. And honestly, I could feel the sweat. Honestly, because you're pushing, you're trying to put toe somebody, and the waves are hitting you. And like I was out of puff as well, hmm. and you're like, oh, my goodness, you know, this is really you're hard. You're your own body weight. You are. All that gear you're carrying. Yeah. And the current is against you. Yeah. And, and their gear. And I was just like, oh, God, I'm hmm. so glad I made it back. You know. I think that's when it really affects when diving can be the most relaxing, easy sport in the world when everything's going on plan. Yeah when the conditions are really mm. simple. If you're hovering on a reef in the Red Sea taking a photo of Nemo, it's not an issue. <laughs> if if suddenly the current picks up or you're forced into a rescue situation, that's when you need it. Everything's well and good when you're just hanging around in the water. But when it when things go off piste, that's when you that's when you really need your fitness. There's a time in the farms, I remember there's a group of us. We're getting we, your anecdotes out today. I know, yeah, I you're just, on form. I was thinking of it and we went around the corner because I'm I'm pretty sure other people will be able to relate to this. Is we're in the sea and we're diving along the far islands, went around the corner. I remember looking ahead, seeing um the, one of the guys who I was with, and I could really see him trying to fin, 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 fin. We just got hit by a current. Mm. And I was thinking, I can't keep this up for like very long. At any stage, it's going to turn around. It's so hard, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. That's and thing. luckily enough, we all turned around and went back with the current. It's like, mm. my goodness. That's the right call, yeah. I was going to say, you know, it's, it's also taken into effect, not just when you're in the water, but on land as well. So, you know, you mentioned with the, the dive at Weybourne in. Yeah. That's quite a significant walk from the car park to the entry point. Yeah. So I don't know how far is it, half a mile, something mm, like that. It yeah. feels like it anyway. So when you load it up with all your equipment, you think a dry suit, mm. that alone weighs, what, five kilograms? It's more than that. Yeah. It's about seven and a half kilos for, really? a, for, it's a, for a kind of a five mil neoprene. And then you've got your weights, everything else, you know, it all in total, your your dive kit alone that you're carrying on your person you know, it's 50, 40, 50 kilograms mm. potentially. Yeah. And that's a lot of weight. You think if you were to pick up, 40, 50 kilograms of just lead blocks, that's a hell of a lot. Yeah. And you're carrying all that before you get in the water. 
Um, so it's thinking of, yeah, not just while you're in the water, but also just, you know, what th- you're, bo- you're putting your body under. I, I was one of the other things as well is, of course, with everybody, you know, we're all getting older and the, it does get harder, doesn't it, mm. to, to, to lose her. Mm. It's so easy, especially in the UK, uh, you know, winter can mm. be quite prolonged. It's nice to have a bar of chocolate and stuff is like it? that. Occasionally. And, <laughs> cake. Cheeky <laughs> Snickers. Or cake. <laughs> and um, it just does take longer to, to shift it. And um, with... You, you know, with your fitness, it just takes that little bit longer and you think, right, okay, I'm going to be diving maybe in April. Maybe mm-hmm. I need to start about it January, get back in the gym, do some cardio, stuff mm-hmm. like that. With that with that view in mind, you know, because yeah. it does take a long while to, to burn and get, get, get yeah. that shifted. Everyone's metabolism is different. So some people might see results within two weeks. Other people, it might take two months to really kind of see and feel the results of, of working out and training. Yeah. Um, and likewise, it's not just about losing weight. Obviously, everyone's different. Mm. We all have our different metabolisms and different um, you know, bodies, the way they work. Um, so in my instance, I'm naturally quite slight. Um, and due to a, a few little health conditions here and there, it's it's quite difficult for me to, to put on weight. And so for me, certainly, it's a case of getting strong, doing strength training, things like that, mm. to kind of not bulk up essentially, but no. to really kind of... Um, but I've seen I've seen you yeah. doing your deadlifts. I, yeah. I know you, you, you yeah. do what you can to, to improve your mm. sort of core strength and overall yeah. strength. I think some women might be scared that, oh, I'll look too bulky or, you know, I'll kind of, um, I'll get too big. But it's not that at all. It's, a, you know, a point of making your joints stronger. Mm. And mentally it helps you as well, you know, sure. it gets you in a good place. And uh, something else we need to uh, touch on is nutrition, because a lot of, um, you know, getting fit, 80% is nutrition and 20% is uh, exercise and working on um, looking at your diet. And we just say that as we're sitting here munching on fig rolls. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me. <anyone. laughs> and uh, it is, uh, nutrition is really important. And as we said, I said earlier, and so is hydration, yeah. uh, making sure you're getting plenty of water in, uh, if you're Anyway, even if you're not a diver, you yeah. know, make sure you get you keep them hydrated. It's really important. Yeah. Uh, but nutrition, make sure you you know you eat getting plenty of veg. Uh, looking at the carbs, cutting down on refined sugar. I've recently just been on a diet myself. You're getting ready for the uh, diver medical uh, at the end of March. Mm-hmm. And um, a lady who I know who goes to the gym has been helping me, who, know, who understands nutrition. Uh, she's been helping me, and I've managed to lose some weight. It's Excellent. been really good, and um, and that's made me it's made me look at um, cutting down sugar, cutting out milk, uh, cut, and that's been a struggle because I love my cup my cup of tea, <laughs> and um, so as. That's really helped me. You can replace it, like you know, if, like you say, sorry to bone, but like you know, making changes to your dairy intake. You can have soya milk now, yeah. almond milk. There's so much choice. But some of them have got high calories, so you have to be a bit Do careful they? about that. Okay. And I tell you what's really weird was that um, I I, cut, I went straight out of cutting sugar out of uh, everything, and uh, I really struggled for a couple of days, and it really hit me. It's like a real where you feel as though you're nearly gonna sort of feel a bit lightheaded because mm. you've got you know your body's craving that sugar mm. because i was used to eating a lot of sugar and uh, to cut that out mm. and replace it with more protein mm. less carbs stuff like that after that first sort of couple of days I feel fine uh, honestly and um something for anyone to look at is maybe your sugar content as well mm. so you're yeah. talking refined sugar refined sugar yeah, yeah. So you yeah. Can still... but even natural sugar still sugar so yeah. you know even things like although apples and stuff like that are you know generally really good mm. they are still quite high in sugar mm. you know and sugar on top of sugar is still sugar mm. okay. i've heard it's um talking to my personal trainer recently it's important to consume protein within 20 minutes of training yeah so then, like you were saying and earlier, small. it repairs the damaged muscle. It really kind of gets that body into yeah. interaction. And for me, I'm targeting on myself on about 120 grams a day. Mm-hmm. Now, your body can't take that in in one go. Mm. A chicken breast is about sort of 20, 20 grams. So at most, in one go, after workout, take on what one of them, mm-hmm. 20 grams, your body can absorb that. Yeah. So it's actually eating more often yeah yeah and uh, often that's helped me quite a lot actually yeah. i found that you know quite good especially with working out and and it, actually just at work mm. cool i think it's really valid and with nutrition I, I think it was lou and i talking the other day about eating junk food and and 
and we use the analogy of if you if you're just constantly eating the wrong stuff, it's like putting petrol in a diesel car. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's absolutely right. I just had was going to mention about um, hydration because we touched on that very briefly a moment ago. Hydration is is super important. You mustn't overhydrate, but you need to make sure you drink plenty of water. One of the things you see at dive sites, particularly in colder environments, is people loading up on tea and coffee. Mm. And being diuretics, you're then expelling that, that fluid from your body. You're becoming dehydrated as a consequence of having, say, a cup of coffee. And also, you've got that urge to pee, which is if you're in a dry <laughs> suit at 20 oh. metres plus, yeah. the last thing you need is is to be zipped in that depth beneath the surface. So m- make sure you, you're drinking the right stuff that's not going to compromise your dive because then that's going to take your mind off the dive. If anyone who's driven along a motorway and has been looking for that sign for the services to peel off because they're, <laughs> they're dying to go to the loon knows that feeling. So you don't want to be distracted when you're at depth by those kind of things. And certainly I can remember working up in Scapa and one of the dive master trainees, I had this very talk with him and he was... Uh, let's say less than receptive to what I had to say and then at the end of the dive we came up and I saw his expression change on a safety stop and I realised he'd peed in his dry suit oh no, oh, so, no. <laughs> no. yeah oh, dear. so afterwards it wasn't it wasn't really a told you so thing but it was you need it. my friend you're going to be you're going to be washing that dry suit out when we get back <laughs> no, to the definitely. Di- back to the dive centre so all these things can come into play one final thing on on hydration I was going to mention is if you're on a liverboard boat somewhere in the Red Sea, if you're on a liveaboard boat in Thailand, they often have those drinking fountains on the boat, and you just need to be aware that the water that you get on those boats isn't going to give you everything you need, because it's the water comes from reverse osmosis. Mm. So a lot of the minerals and the nutrients that you need aren't in there. So do be aware of that. Perhaps take some sachets of electrolytes mm. that you can find in boots or in a lot of supermarkets yeah. as well, just to don't overdo it because otherwise you'll run into some other problems <laughs> where you'll be in and out of the toilet Dirty a little bed. bit too much. Yeah. Yeah. But you do need to maintain that hydration if you're going to be diving. Yeah, and um, something um, our listeners might find helpful, they may not, I don't know, um, something that's helped me because I find water a little bit sort of sort of hard to drink sometimes, a bit, can be a bit sort of bit monotonous. Boring. Yeah, and um, I find hot water. Uh, straight from the kettle, obviously wait for it to cool down, uh, nicer to drink, that's that's quite good. And also uh, in my water jug, I put in uh, frozen orange and lemon segments. Love so that. actually, yeah. so if you freeze it, mm. um, it helps keep the water cool. And also when it thaws, you get the taste of the orange and lemons in, in your water. And you can keep that in there all day. Yeah. Um, you know, and keep topping up your water bottle because you're cutting down plastic mm. as well. Mm you know, because you're not buying water bottles. And um, you can just keep topping that up and you get that sort of faint taste of zesty goodness. Mm -hmm. And the goodness in the lemon also um, boosts hydration. does, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's good. I think aside from just the general fitness side of it is as people get older, obviously you're predisposed to some of the more horrible things, whether it's a heart attack or a stroke and these kind of things. And in fact, in researching to do this, I, I looked at an article that was in um, Diver magazine in May 2018, written by a guy called Mark Powell. And if you're based in the UK, Mark Powell's quite a famous technical diver. And he was looking at the diving incident reports from BZAC, where every year they they make an assessment and they give out statistics, Same, very similar to how Dan, the Diver Alert Network, do. And it says here in the article, every year a significant portion of fatalities are attributed to non-diving related medical incidents for example a heart attack while in the water equally the majority of fatalities occur in divers aged over 50 and he's he says here unless divers get less skilled or less cautious cautious as they get older it's reasonable to assume that many of these incidents are health related Mm. so as you get older of course you're predisposed to that and if you're if you're an older uh, person going diving you need to be extra cautious and, and take extra care of your fitness for for other reasons not just for the fitness reason but just for taking care of yourself generally mm. to avoid these kind of incidents and i think that is a good point because i've done when well, i've done shore cover here i've you know you see stuff and i've questioned and i think you know i've, I've seen a guy 
with a uh, twin set on, they're heavy, you get a twin set on sure, your back yeah. after a dive, trying to clamber out in the water, and you think, you know, and I offered to help, and you refused, and I think, well, okay, I, you know, it's fine, um, but there's no, you're not going to get a medal for it, you know, if if you need okay. a hand, you need a hand. It's not supposed to be an endurance test, and, and certainly no. I've helped out with surface cover at Stony Cove a few times on our training weekends, and I've seen all sorts of things sat there on the key, you know, like you're saying, you know, don't want to kind of like, you know, body shame or cast judgment, but they're usually gentlemen of a certain age, quite portly, you know, sort of technical divers, and they're having to get their mates to literally haul them up the steps and they're purple in the face. Yeah. And that's not good. No, you, at that no. point, you need to surely no, you're not look in the mirror and think... Okay, maybe I need something to something needs do to change. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it does seem to be. I know something. Um, it does seem to be an element of. I think we're moving right maybe onto a different topic. I don't know, but it seems to be. Well, I've noticed that you see men of that age in their fifties and, and above. I think it's more men though. What I've seen, men, yeah. where the, they think they're invincible, and I think you. And yeah. I can see their faces gone they don't scarlet. Like to be told. I know, <laughs> and, and you think. You, why are you putting yourselves in that risk? Or, and, and like Marcus was saying, it's not fair on their buddies either. No. Seeing your your buddy it's just <laughs> in a, a bit of a, a state a like that is quite stressful, you know. Mm. And it is just a hobby. Exactly. That, you yeah. know, There's no medals being given out. I think, I think we touched on this in a previous episode yeah. where Ian was like, the most important thing is we get home at the end it of the is. day. It is. <laughs> most, I always and say he that. went into sort of a 20-minute rant about, well, we need to make sure we get but home. But it's true, isn't it? You know, you always got to make sure you get home at the yeah. end of the day. life's mantra, isn't yes. it? Yes, <laughs> exactly. get home. Now, now, we've just spoken for, for quite a while about dive fitness and we've given our own kind of opinion. I just want to just underline that it's just our <laughs> opinion on, 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 on maintaining your fitness and things, steps you can take in order to maintain your fitness and the kind of fitness you need for diving and why you need that fitness. But I was going to quote something here from Dan, the Diver Alert Network, and they have a alert diver section within their website where you can look at articles by proper diving doctors on recommendations and there's an article there which you'll be able to find by a doctor called Neil W Pollock PhD and within that he's proposed a series of tests just to evaluate recreational divers as an alternative to the 200 meters and he's he's said here within the article and this will give you an idea and give you some context to kind of very basic levels you might look to achieve one simple series was proposed to evaluate recreational divers divers would demonstrate the following capabilities. Number one, lift and carry individual items of diving equipment on land. Seems fairly mm-hmm. yeah. typical. You know, can you can you actually lift your tank yeah. and, and walk it several yards? Mm. Seems fairly simple. But, you know, like we said, if some people are on liverboards, they're dressed, they just fall into the water off the back of the boat, they they never have to deal with that Literally. kind of thing. Yeah, mm. yeah, pretty much. Number two, stand from, from sitting and walk 100 feet, so that's about 30 metres, in standard scuba equipment. So can you walk fully kitted, comfortably, <laughs> 30 metres? With fins on? <laughs> you can if you want to. <laughs> uh, number three, and this ties in with what you were saying about exiting the water, Lou. Number three is ascend a five-foot vertical ladder from the water wearing standard scuba equipment. Do you have that kind of strength? And mm. I know you do your deadlifting. I do a lot of like the sumo squats mm. and, and those kind of things in the gyms, yeah. carrying weights to kind of strengthen my, yeah. my legs for that, that very reason. Number four, swim underwater at at least half a knot for 30 minutes and 1.2 knots for three minutes wearing standard scuba gear. So can you maintain a, a reasonable pace under the water without becoming overexerted as mm. you do it? Yeah. So... They're kind of basic fitness proposals that this this chap, Dr. Neil Pollock, has put forward. And it seems reasonable to me. I love the fact that he's called Pollock. He's sort of yeah, yeah, a exactly. Is he a sea <laughs> diver by any chance? <laughs> yeah. Loves That's the fantastic, sea. fantastic, isn't it? Mr. Pollock loves the sea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. His, his neighbour is Mr. Bob Cod. Not a, not a made-up name. <laughs> Well, we've talked about made-up names before in previous episodes. <laughs> Elaborate, gregarious. <laughs> no, but so they're they're kind of what this this diving doctor has said. It kind of baselines for that. In addition to the two hundred meter swims, and that seems reasonable mm. to me. Mm. But yeah, diving fitness for reducing your air consumption, for rescuing, for being a responsible buddy, all these things 
I think yeah. are really, really important. Have you guys got anything else you'd like to add about diving fitness? Yeah, I was just going to kind of say, you know, not everyone is keen on going to a gym. Certainly if you're just starting out with fitness, it can be quite daunting. The, the thought of walking into a gym and being surrounded by muscle-bound fit freaks, you know, can be quite intimidating. Wearing the vest tops. Yeah, yeah. wearing their kind of street do vests that? and whatnot. But you don't always need to go to a gym to, to keep up with your fitness. Like you say, you can go for a walk if you're lucky enough to live in the countryside, even better. Um, and there's a lot of um, apps now that you can download with fitness programs on. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of apparatus that you can use at home. So resistance bands, I'm a big fan of, for example, mm -hmm. um, which are great for creating that resistance and you know really working those joints and muscles. Um, you can buy dumbbells and kettlebells. At most high street stores or online now. Yeah, get um, out on your bike. Get out on your bike, yeah. So you don't always necessarily need to join a gym or, you know, pay loads of money no. to get fit. It's no. accessible for everyone. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It can be just a simple choice of going up the stairs instead of taking a lift yeah. or elevator in your office. Yeah. You know? I would recommend get some swimming then, though. Yeah. Definitely. Swimming definitely helps because yeah. there's no resist. You know, as, swimming is one of them exercises that you can do and it doesn't wear out your joints and stuff like that. You know, you, it's uh, and you get good resistance. So swimming yeah. is a really good exercise. Mm. I think you're absolutely right. Ian. I think we've rabbited quite a bit about fitness now. Yeah, I think I think everyone's got the idea. You know, we're off yeah. to the gym. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I've been. Absolutely. <laughs> um, before we go, just wanted to mention again, um, for those of you who are enjoying the podcast, do rate and review it wherever your podcast provider is or every little helps if you really want to join our gang you can go to patreon.com slash scuba confidential you can have a voice you can potentially be a guest on the show ian may even buy you a there cake. may be cake <laughs> there may be cake involved and it will allow you just to become part of the whole scuba confidential experience for <laughs> want of a better word and we'd love to have more people get involved yeah. with what we're yeah. doing even if you just wanted to drop us an email or a, a tweet with questions or comments and we'd love to hear from you oh i just want to echo that because i think it's really important to uh you know when you do listen to us wherever you listen to us if it's itunes or whatever to rate review we need you know we really do need your rates your ratings and reviews don't and sound to, too uh, needy well we do we, you know it all helps doesn't it you know it, uh, it, helps, it helps us and uh, helps us you know go up the charts and things like that which you know, is like what we us. need <laughs> Yeah, so I think we're I think we're going to leave it there. Yeah. Shall we link it there? Let's we'll, leave, we'll leave that there, and we'll wind up the podcast. Thank you for listening, and we'll hopefully see you next time on Scuba Confidential. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Thanks for listening. This is just an independent podcast and we don't represent Paddy, SSI, BZAC or any other training agencies. Uh, we are just three friends sitting around talking about diving and other diving related issues. Just in our opinions, that's it. Uh, you can contact us on the usual social media sites. Instagram, Scuba Confidential. Facebook at Scuba Confidential. Twitter at Scuba Confident. One email at scubaconfidential at gmail.com, and you can support us also on a site called Patreon at patreon.com backslash scuba confidential. And lastly, just want to say thank you to Plunkett for the excellent music. Over and out, peace and love.